Miss Abhishek started a lot of very interesting discussion in the chat about episode 131. Stephen White and others gave some sparkling input. Discussion was particularly centred on Brahe's model of the universe. Tycho Brahe's model, in which the Earth is stationary at the centre, is as far as I know the only model which has never been refuted. It has the moon and the sun going around the Earth and everything else going around the sun. About 300 years ago, when James Bradley was observing a small star, Gamma Draconis, making a tiny elliptical circuit every year, he assumed it was proof of the Copernican system in which the Earth orbits the Sun. But Ruggiero Boscovich pointed to Brahe's model and said this was a way to prove whether Brahe or Copernicus was right. George Biddle Airy did Boscovich's experiment. He found the result everyone had agreed would prove Brahe and disprove Copernicus. Of course, as we've seen throughout the videos on this channel, that doesn't mean that scientists will accept the result of the experiment. They will instead make up an ad hoc hypothesis to justify ignoring what the experiment shows them. When almost perfect constancy of the cosmic background radiation disproved their accepted story, they brought in inflation. When the rotation of galaxies disproved their accepted story, they brought in dark matter. When their expanding universe theory went pear-shaped, they brought in dark energy. And when Airy did Boscovich's experiment and disproved Copernicus's universe, they brought in partial dragging of the ether. Then everybody forgot about Brahe for 200 years. And Einstein came up with his theory of relativity, which dismissed the ether, making it possible to prove that it is impossible to prove if the Earth is moving or not. But then Walter van der Kamp, a Dutch science teacher working in Canada, examined the evidence for the Copernican system. He couldn't find any. He looked for the evidence for an Earth-centred universe and he found plenty. Experiments from Arago through Bradley, Mascar, Rayleigh, Theodore de Coudre, Druton and Noble to Michelson and Morley. They'd all been ignored or explained away, typically by partial dragging of the ether. Van der Kamp found that the evidence pointed to Brahe's model of the universe in which the Earth is not moving, the moon and sun move around the Earth, and everything else is carried around the Earth by the sun, just as the moons of the planets are carried around the sun by the planets. He wrote a book, De Labore Solis, which is Latin for On the Labours of the Sun, in which he promoted this Earth-centred universe with the sun carrying everything else around with it. Van der Kamp became a campaigner for geocentricity. He started the publication Biblical Astronomy. His work was taken over by Gerardus Bow, an American with Dutch ancestry. There have been a few geocentrists promoting geocentricity for about 40 years. About 10 years ago, a controversial, dynamic, Catholic apologist, Robert Sungenis, was won over by reading Jerry Bowe's book, 
geocentricity. He's made a movie and written books on the subject. As far as I can tell, his stand on geocentricity is sound. He's the first person I've come across who describes Brahe's model as having the sun at the dynamic centre of the universe and the earth at its true centre. That may sound like a tricky concept, but it is a good representation. It reminds me of my brilliant former lecturer Eric Laithwaite. In episode 80, we saw him at the 1974 Royal Institution Christmas Lectures. He demonstrated, among other things, that mass is comparable to electricity in one of its properties when it's spinning. In this theatre, someone said, Mr Faraday, what use is all this? And he was my personal hero. He was the man who showed that Ohm's law was only all right for DC. I'm using this coil again. You put DC through it from a battery and you get four amps and eight volts. That coil has a property all its own which we call resistance, Ohm's law. And with eight volts and four amps you get two ohms. Now we'll apply some alternating current to the same coil. The voltage is in fact 32. So now we have 4 amps and 32 volts and we have apparently 8 ohms. We call them ohms but they're not in Ohm's law. Ohm's law can't have two different values at the same time. The interesting thing is that over 140 years later we don't say that Ohm's law was wrong. We simply say it is restricted to the use of DC. So, however distasteful it is, we now have to say that object has got something more than a mass. It's got a mass, so long as, and a mass only, so long as we want to push it about in straight lines, weigh it, accelerate it, so on. But if we ever choose to spin it, it has another property, all of its own, which corresponds to the inductance of a coil. He gave a lecture at the Royal Society, demonstrating apparently previously unnoticed properties of spinning gyroscopes. What he said was considered heretical. But let's look at just one of his demonstrations. A gyroscope is a curious device in which conventional physics seems to go out of the window. First of all, we spin up the wheel, and it's then what I call live, as opposed to when it's not spinning, dead. So what I'm going to do is to hang this large weight on, and then as it's rotating, hang on the weight, it precesses, it has angular momentum about the vertical, we catch the weight next time round, hop, and the angular momentum just simply disappears, it seems to evaporate. It makes you question the validity of the Newton's third law. Action and reaction are equal and opposite, and this is another experiment that appears to defy conventional physics. And you see, this is not doing what the physics book says it should, because the mass centre is certainly not the centre of rotation. And that's not what is supposed to happen. The vast majority of the mass of the gyroscope is spinning about the centre of the disc. But the point which is stationary is the pivot point. In this demonstration, the pivot is far from the disc, so it's easy to see what's going on. In the Brahe situation, the spin centre, the sun, and the stationary pivot, the earth, are quite close together. In the full Brahe model, above and below the spinning disc are many stars. But in principle, the whole universe is spinning with the solar system. Its dynamic centre is the sun. The stationary point is the earth, which God tells us he hangs on nothing. We can see the spinning disc rocking slowly up and down with respect to the pivot. This is a representation 
of the seasonal movement of the sun and stars. The wrath of the establishment descended on Laithwaite, and he was thoroughly cancelled. Such was the hostility that the Royal Institution, for the only time in its history, didn't publish the discourse, as if they were trying to pretend Laithwaite had never given it. It hadn't happened. Even today, 20 years later, none of his eminent colleagues will publicly talk about that evening, or indeed about Laithwaite himself. After the discourse that never was, Laithwaite was banished from the scientific establishment. Historically, it's, uh, it seems to be almost an integral part of the, uh, of the scientific process because uh, many of the famous names of the past, heroes of science, in fact, like Faraday and the Wright brothers, people like Edison, they were all in their day ostracised and ridiculed. Um, because their contemporaries were unable to see that what they were doing was an advance in science. They perceived it as being dabbling in some kind of occult or taboo subject. There have always been eccentrics in the history of science. There have always been Eric Laithwaite, and they've always been derided and marginalised. But I think in the last 10, 20 years, the process seems to have accelerated. It's become worse and worse as science has become more institutionalised, more bureaucratic. It's become pub almost entirely publicly funded. Uh, the sort of sanctions which institutional science is able to bring to bear on the eccentric um, have multiplied. And today, if you don't toe the line, if you... Uh, and you don't have to uh, make a radically new discovery. You can be... Uh, you can be ostracised simply for thinking about it. I suppose you could say, does it matter if science ridicules and ostracises a person who doesn't play by the rules? But I think it does matter. I think it matters to all of us because practically every major advance in technology in the last hundred years has been some kind of defiance of the rules. But this derision, this uh, perception of the research being without value, without merit, that alone can be enough to kill off promising lines of research. Um, the worrying thing about this is that when you look back at the history of science, it isn't those on the inside that produce the innovations, it's those on the outside, it's the Eric Laithwaite of this world, the people who are perceived as the eccentrics that produce the inventions. An important point about this is that after being rejected, cancelled and ostracised from science, Laithwaite devoted his whole research effort to the behaviour of gyroscopes he discovered why gyroscopes behave so strangely. He discovered that there was mass transfer taking place. We devised more and more sophisticated experiments until, not long ago, we cracked it. The real breakthrough came when we realised that a processing gyroscope could move mass through space. The spinning top showed us that all the time, but we couldn't see it. If the gyroscope does not produce the full amount of centrifugal force on its pivot in the centre, then indeed you have produced mass transfer. He knew better than to say this transfer was by way of the ether. But he shouldn't have needed to be so careful. Einstein had acknowledged, according to the general theory of relativity, Space without ether is unthinkable, for in such space there not only would be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for standards of space and time. Harold Aston demonstrated transfer of inertia as well as electromagnetism by way of the ether. Nikola Tesla had connected the ether with both matter and electromagnetism many years earlier. But the scientific community can't accept this. The best in the field dictum demands that there must be no ether. So if other aspects of the behaviour of the universe involve mass transfer or electromagnetic transfer, or anything else to do with the ether, then our establishment scientists will have no option but to explain them away, with more of their abstruse mathematical stories, and we will be expected to believe them. 
and they will eventually be proved wrong. Along with the other imaginative stories we are being fed under the guise of Serbina's mathematical fiction. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.